Hi there, my name is Jonathan McIntosh and in this video I would like to talk to you about gamelan ensembles from the Indonesian island of Bali. In particular I would like to discuss um, three aims for this video. So I'm going to situate um, Balinese gamelan music within a historical and a social context. And in order to do this I'm going to um, discuss certain examples or types of Balinese gamelan ensembles that are um, important to the musical history of Bali. And these particular ensembles have developed from approximately the 15th to the 20th century. And all these types of gamelan ensembles are still actually um, performed in Bali today. And I'm going to discuss that as part of the video. And then finally, um, towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to discuss one particular form of gamelan ensemble in more detail. And this is a type of ensemble known as gamelan gonkabiar, or gonkabiar for short. And it's the most common um, or widespread ensemble in Bali today. So I'm going to discuss why this is the case and what's the historical and the social context that enabled Gong Kabyar to become um, so popular. So on the screen, you can see a map of the island of Bali. Um, there are approximately 3 million um, Balinese. And um, as you can see, the island is divided into eight uh, districts. Um, and these uh, districts are based on the historical kingdoms that used to um, survive in Bali, uh, in the feudal system. Um, Balinese, the Balinese make up approximately just under 2% of uh, the Indonesian population, so the very um, small percentage of the overall population. However, the significance of Bali in terms of ethnomusicological and anthropological um, research is, is actually quite significant. Um, there were uh, groundbreaking studies conducted in the 1930s by famous scholars such as Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson in anthropology and in music research uh, by the pianist and musicologist Colin McPhee. So the word Bali actually means offering. And um, Bali is, a, 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 in Bali, the main religion is Bali Hinduism. And this is a mixture of Hinduism, Buddhism, and animism, which includes um, spirit worship or ancestor worship. The link between the Bali Hindu religion and the word offering is actually quite quite important because in rituals in Bali, rituals or religious ceremonies, for example, there has to be music and there has to be dance performed as part of these rituals in order for the event to be complete. So if there isn't music and there isn't dance performances, um, you can't say that the ceremony has been a success. The fact that music and dance play such an important role in the Bali Hindu religion dates back to early contact between um, the, the island of Bali and the part of eastern Java. And this was primarily during the 9th century. And this is when Java was um, Hindu as well. So the Islam hadn't really arrived in Java and doesn't arrive until much later. Um, so by the mid-14th century, so the mid-1300s, Bali becomes part of the famous Majapahit Empire. And the Majapahit Empire was uh, a very important Hindu-Javanese kingdom situated in East Java. And then by the end of the 15th century, the Majapahit Empire is the last Hindu Javanese kingdom to be defeated um, by a, a neighboring kingdom um, that had um, converted to Islam. So because 
before the 15th century, Bali had become part of the Majapahit Empire. It had become annexed in a certain way. This meant that a set, the same kind of court or feudal system was in operation in East Java, uh, where the Majapahit Kingdom was situated, and in Bali. So when the courtiers from the Majapahit Empire were defeated by uh, the neighboring kingdom, the Islamic kingdom called Denmark, um, the Majapahit courtiers upped and moved to Bali, where they resided in relative peace, um, despite certain skirmishes and wars between neighboring kingdoms on the island of Bali. They, they didn't succumb to external colonization until much later. And as a result of this, they took the Majapahit performing arts, so influences like gamelan and dance drama and the languages and the stories that were associated um, with these performance styles. They took them to Bali and the, the performing arts really flourished in the court systems there. And the courts were important for sponsoring um, the performing arts um, from the 15th century right up until the turn of the 20th century. So one of the earliest forms of gamelan ensemble um, that still exists in Bali today is a, a form called gamelan gambu. And gamelan gambu is the musical accompaniment to an ancient form of dance drama which is called gambu. And this dance drama performs the stories of the Majapahit era. Um, it uses an archaic language called Kawi, K-A-W-I, which is a form of old Javanese that's not really spoken in Java anymore, although it is used by puppet masters or dalangs in Java. The movements are very archaic and protracted, and the action in a Gambu dance drama tends to be quite slow, so it's not like in a Wayang Kulit performance where there are lots of battles to keep people uh, amused and engaged in the long episodes of the storytelling. So Gambu had been in existence for over 500 years and the style takes its name uh, from the word Gambu and Gambu refers to these very long flutes that you can, you can see in um, the picture on the screen, and this picture comes from a book by um, the Canadian ethnomusicologist Colin McPhee, who lived in Bali during the 1930s. And these flutes are very, very long, and in order to actually play the sulin and blow the air down the tube, they have to position them on the ground quite far in front of them like this, and you can see that they're placing the flutes on the mat in front of the performers. So in Gambu, the flutes play the melody, and this is because up until this time or in the 15th century or just before the 15th century, the technology hadn't necessarily developed to make metallophones or metallophone-like instruments with the metal keys. So the flutes um, made of bamboo, which was um, available all around um, the, in Java and in Bali, they used bamboo in order to play the melody. Other instruments in a gambu ensemble would include um, drums and small gongs, as well as some chime gongs and some cymbals. Um, but the main melody is carried by the suling. Another much larger type of ensemble that is still performed in parts of Bali today is the great gamelan style, or gamelan gongade, or it can also be translated as gamelan with the large gongs. This is an important style of gamelan music because it was used for ritual um, functions and in temple ceremonies. And it's performed by a very large ensemble, as you can see. Sometimes more than 40 musicians playing together. In this picture, which is also taken by Colin McPhee from the 1930s, you can see metallophone type instruments with the gantung tubes, so the bamboo tubes, um, which the sound resonates down in order to produce a particular timbre. 
But if you look at the bottom left-hand corner of the picture, you can also see what look to be like Tharon-type instruments. And this is another influence, a link between Java and Bali at this time. So that's a Tharon kind of cross metallophone instrument mixed in with the Gantong metallophones. So in Bali, they really developed this notion of Gangtung metallophones um, within their various ensembles. Gamelan Gongade tends to play quite slow, stately, uh, long pieces of music, and it's incredibly loud um, and so ideal for playing outside at temple ceremonies. And this kind of developed from Gambo in the 16th and 17th centuries. Following Gambo, we have another important style of gamelan in Bali, and this is a style called gamelan samar pengulingan. And it's very different to Gongade and Gambu, its predecessors. It takes its name from the Hindu god of love, Samar, and Pengulingan literally means laying down, lying down. So in effect, this was the gamelan ensemble that played outside the king's bedchamber in the royal palace or the royal courts in Bali. And it was used to, as entertainment for the king and played outside his bedchamber because it has a very sweet, delicate, um, a much thinner sound than compared to Gamelan Gonga Day. Um, and it dates around by it from the time to the 17th century, and it was still very important right up until the turn of the 20th century. Samar Pengulingan can play some of the repertoire from Gongade and Gambu, and um, it's used for ritual and entertainment purposes. Gamelan Gendarwayang is quite a different form of ensemble. It is a quartet of four metallophones, and it's a quartet that is used to accompany Balinese um, Wayang Kulit performances. And this is quite a contrast to um, Central or East Javanese Wayang Kulit, where an entire gamelan would be used to accompany an event. Gundar Wayang is uh, the playing technique is quite similar to uh, the Gender that's used in Central Javanese gamelan. And that means that the performer has two mallets and dance the notes using the bass and the side of the hands. It's a technically very difficult instrument to play. And the left hand plays the melody and the right hand plays interlocking parts, so decorative, elaborative parts. Out of the ensembles that I've discussed so far, Gender Wang is the only slendral form of ensemble um, that I've discussed so far. So Gambu, Gongade, and Smart um, and are all Pelog, and Slendro um, and is Slendro. And for each of the styles of music that I've been discussing in this presentation, you can go um, onto the Moodle website and listen to recordings of these musics to hear how they sound and also maybe uh, to figure out if you can spot developments in the music and the aesthetics. So describing these four styles of gamelan ensemble, and today in Bali there are over 30 styles of gamelan, some which are very popular and some which are very, very rare. So gambu, for example, is a very rare uh, type of ensemble, and there are maybe only four or five performing groups still functioning in Bali, but it's very important in the historical development of music on the island. So, round about the mid-1850s, the Dutch succeeded in taking control of the northern half of Bali. And they succeeded in controlling the northern half rather than the southern half because 
straight through the middle of the valley, there's a, a chain of volcanoes. And this tends to separate the north from the south. Um, and we can see that separation today in the forms of Balinese language. So they have different forms of vocab vocabulary. And in the different styles of, of music and dance that they also perform. However, the Dutch invaded Southern Bali in 1906 and gradually took full control of the entire island by 1908. With the arrival of a colonial power, the Dutch decided to keep the royal court system in place. But instead of having real power, um, the courts actually lost some of their power in this context. So the royal court started to decline. They lost some of their income. They could no longer perform. Uh, afford to employ many, many musicians and dancers and other artists um, to help entertain the king. So this meant that the patronage of the performing arts gradually shifted from the royal courts, where it had always been situated before this time, to uh, groups in villages. And because royal courts had to sell some of their gamelan ensembles in order to raise money, this meant that the village groups had, um, could buy their own gamelan ensembles, and they can actually be creative um, with the types of gamelan music that they performed. And this is significant because as the royal courts sold some of their gamelan ensembles, the, the older styles of gamelan ensembles, such as gamelan smar penguilingan, for example, the villagers would take these ensembles and smelt the bronze down and recast the bronze as new ensembles. So they would experiment and create new forms of musical groups. And round about 1915, um, which is the date that's stated in a lot of the literature, but we now have some evidence that it might have been slightly before this time, this is when a new style of gamelan ensemble emerges. And this ensemble was called gamelan gongkepiar, and it emerged first in the northern half of the island, but quickly spread to the southern part, and indeed it spread across the island. So the word kebyar is a it's an onomatopoeic sound. Uh, it's an onomatopoeic word, and it's quite hard to translate into kind of Western um, language. But if it can be translated as lightning, so sudden. Um, and it can also mean when you strike a match, it's that blue color before the match turns yellow. It's that kind of excitement. That just <sighs> and that's kind of the aesthetic that's associated with kabyar. So kabyar music has lots of sudden shifts in dynamics. So it can be soft and then very, very loud. It can have lots of irregular, jaggy rhythms, um, and these are particular facets of the musical style. And we can see an early picture here of Gamelan Gonkipiar from the 1930s, taken by Colin McPhee. And Gamelan Gonkipiar was, it was a craze at the time in the early part of the 20th century. People couldn't get enough of this new style of Gamelan and it quickly spread from the northern part of the island to the southern part of the island. And this meant that there was starting to become a common type of ensemble around the island, but something that had never really happened before. Um, and it meant that you could have competitions um, between particular gamelans. So uh, you'd have two gamelan ensembles set up in opposition to one another, and they would play a different pieces against one another in order to see who could become uh, the winner or the best group. And this helped to promote Gamelan Gonkabyar as very important at this time. Gamelan Gonkabyar was also significant for another reason, because it accumulated or took into its repertoire music that belonged to earlier styles of ensembles. So pieces performed by Gamelan Gongade, by Samar Pangolingan, they all became part of the Gamelan Gongkepiar repertoire. 
And it meant that Gamalan Gonkabyar could straddle contexts from ritual temple settings to secular entertainment settings. And it could play the repertoire for both of these contexts. So instead of needing separate ensembles, one for ritual and one for entertainment, for example, you could just have Gamalan Gonkabyar and it would fulfill both of these purposes. And this is another reason why it became popular and started to shift out or um, uh, the popularity of other ensembles started to decline. So these are some of the instruments in a Gamalan Gong Kabyar ensemble. And if you just look at um, the instruments, you can maybe see that there are some instruments that are quite similar to those in the central Japanese gamelan ensemble. So for example, we have, still have um, wooden flutes, suling, uh, though they're quite, they're much shorter than compared to gambo sulings. We have a rebab, we have a drum, which is called, still called a kendang, and we have various types of suspended gongs, um, a large suspended gong, and then a middle-sized gong, and then a very small gong. We have chime gongs as well, but they look slightly different to the bonang. Okay, so let's describe some of these instruments briefly. Let's take the gongs to start off with. The large gong in a gong kibyar ensemble is called gong again, in the same way as in a Japanese gamelan ensemble. However, the gong again in Bali tends to be a little bit smaller and has a shorter decay. So it doesn't resonate for as long as a Japanese gong. The other gong in the hanging stand is called a kampur. And kampur is a smaller gong, a little bit similar to the kampu, although the manufacture of the gong is, is slightly different. And in, in it, it's almost slightly larger than the kampus. And then in the wooden frame, you can see that the ornate wooden frame is a very small gong. And this is called a clintong. And it's got a very high pitch and it plays a, a very important part in the music ensemble. It cuts through the structure. Um, so these three uh, gongs are in frames, along with the single chime gong in the wooden um, frame, at the, the bottom of the right-hand side there, that's called a kumpli or a kajar, depending on which part of the island you are. These four gongs help to formulate the colotomic structure of music in gong, gamelan gong kibyar. And in Bali, they use different colotomic structures than um, in Java. Before we talk about the instruments on the long wooden racks, the chime gongs, let's now move and talk about the metallophone type instruments that have the gantung um, tubes. So let's start at the bottom left hand corner with the very small um, metallophone. This is called a cantil or a cantilan, and it's the highest sounding metallophone. And then directly above that is the middle sounding metallophone called a pimade. And then to the right of the Pimade, you have um, the melodic leader of a Balinese Grand Kibyar ensemble. And this instrument is called Ugal. Above the Ugal, there's an instrument called a Chalung. And this instrument has the bottom five notes of the Ugal. And it kind of abstracts the melody. And then to the left of the chandong, you have the, a very large and very heavy um, metallophone type instrument. And this is called a jagogin, or sometimes it's shortened to jagog. And it plays the important melody notes. So it kind of provides the bass line in a gamelan gong kibyar. If we now move to talk about the chime gongs on the long wooden racks, we look at the one closest to the gongs. This is an instrument with 10 chime gongs, and it's called a trompong. And a trompong is another melodic leader, and it plays a decorative, elaborating part in relation to the melody. The trompong is not always used in gamelan gong music. The trompong 
is really there as a way to connect Gong Kapyar to earlier styles of music. So, for example, if you go back and look at the slide for Samar Pengulingan, you'll see that at the front of that picture, there's a trompon for Samar Pengulingan. The next long wooden rack with chime gongs, it has 14 chime gongs and it's called a rayong. And whereas the trompon is played by one person, the rayong is usually played by four people. And they play fast interlocking parts and that also help depict important rhythm, rhythmic elements in the music. The last remaining instrument on this on the slide is in the bottom right hand corner and this is an instrument called Cheng Cheng. And the Cheng Cheng are cymbals and it's usually um, four or five upturned cymbals and then the player holds two cymbals in their hands and these cymbals come down on the upturned cymbals and they produce a sound called Cheng 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 Cheng. The Cheng Cheng are, is important because it helps to articulate certain rhythms in the music and these rhythms in relation to dance performance also help to articulate the movements of a dancer in performance. And in dance performance it's the drum and the cheng cheng um, that help that work together um, in relation to the dancers in order to communicate um, certain signals to the musicians accompanying the dance performance. So in a Gong Kibyar Ensemble, you would normally have four Kantil, four Pemade, two Ugal, two Chalung, and two Jagogen. And you can see this in the reading by Michael Tenzer um, for uh, the key readings. And he has a slightly different picture that kind of shows all the various instruments, how many there are in an ensemble. But with the other remaining instruments, apart from the kandang, where you'd have two kandangs, there tends to be um, one of each. There might also be two large gongs, and uh, we'll talk about this right now. So this is how you would classify a gamelan gong kabyar ensemble according to Hornbostel Sachs system. So the suling is the type of aerophone, and there can be different types of suling, large suling, small suling, medium suling. The rabab is the only chordophone in a gamelan gong kabyal. The majority of inst instruments are idiophones, such as the metallophones. Um, the collective name given to the ugal, pamade, and cantilan is the term gangsu. Then there's the chalung, which abstracts the melody, and the jagogan, which plays the bass notes taken from the melody. There are suspended bossed gongs, the gong again, the kanpur, and the klentong. The klentong can also be referred to with a different term, kemong, and that depends on which part of the island you're in. With reference to gong again, you can see that there are two other words following that in the brackets. The word wadon means female, and the word lanan means male. So if there are two large gongs, the wadon or the female gong will be the bigger gong and the deeper sounding gong, and the lanan will be the the male gong will be the slightly smaller gong and it will have a higher pitch than the wadon. Then we have cradled boss gongs which include the trompon and the rayon and the kumpli or the kajar. Symbols, cheng cheng, which are small symbols. We, there are also larger symbols um, called cheng cheng kopyak. And then we have the membranophone, the kandangs. And we have a, a larger female drum which is deeper in pitch, and a smaller male drum, which is slightly higher in pitch. When we talk about melody in Balinese gamelan, they have a different term for melody. So whereas in Java, the term balungan denotes the skeleton melody, um, to which other parts elaborate their, or abstract um, the, the rules that they play in the ensemble, in Balinese gamelan, they use the word pokok to denote melody. So um, if you see this in the literature, don't get confused. And as I've already stated, the Balinese gamelan also uses different cholesterol-like structures to those that exist in Java. 
Um, so don't be confused to say that in Bali they use Lanchanan structures, for example, because, because they don't. And this is because the music has developed in a particular way uh, since the 15th century. If we were to categorize the different ensembles into what they do in an ensemble, well, we have instruments that elaborate the melody, and these include the Gansa instruments, the Ugal, the Tamade, and the Cantil, as well as the Changong instruments, the Rayong, the Trompon, the Suling, which is the flute, and the Rabab, the spike fiddle. Instruments that abstract the melody or play the melody notes include the Chalung, which is the instrument that has the same five notes as the bottom of the Ugal. And then those that reinforce the melody or mediate the melody, um, that's the jagogin that plays the bass notes, abstracted from the melody. The colotomic structure is performed by the gongs the, and the kumpli, and the drums, the rayong, and the cheng cheng, the cymbals, elaborate on the colotonic structure. One final important uh, issue to discuss in relation to Balinese gamelan is the notion of kotikin. And kotikin is a form of interlocking or hocketing, where you have two separate parts that, when played together, produce a continuous musical line. And kotikin is a very, very Balinese um, idea in relation to gamelan music. and particularly in relation to Gamelan Kunkabyan. If you listen to such recordings, you will definitely hear Gotikin patterns. And these are played by the high metallophones, the Pinade and the Cantil, the Rayon, and drums also play Gotikin or interlocking parts. The two parts that together form the one continuous line in Gotikin are called polos, and this is a part that's closely aligned with the melody or the pokok, and then sang si, which follows polos and interlocks with this line. So when, in terms of interlocking, what we mean by that is that we're in polos, notes, certain notes will be played, and where there's a rest or a gap in the polos part, the sang si part will play a note during that rest or the gap in order to form a continuous musical line. And syncopation often occurs as a result of cotican, so a very specific um, Balinese aesthetic. And on this screen, you can see an example of cotican and bat, which means cotican with four pitches. And I'm not, I can't, I probably won't sing the correct pitches, but you can see the, the notes on top with the stems of the notes going up this way. That's the polos part. And the notes on the bottom with the stems going down, that is the sang si part. So the rhythm for the polos would be de da de da de da de da de da de de da 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 da de da de da de da de da da de 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 da so I might sound like something from Doctor Who or the Dalek, but Gotikin is used because the music is played at such a fast speed, and that's why you can't play the two parts in the one musical line, and you need to split it up in order to perform it at such a fast tempo. And it's something that's very particular to Balinese gamelan music. So, in conclusion, we have discussed gamelan music in Bali and situated it within a historical and a social context. The link between the hindu javanese kingdom of Majapahit and its relationship with Bali is crucial um, for the influence and the development of the performing arts in the Balinese courts from the 15th to the 20th century. We've outlined four different types of Balinese gamelan out of the, over the, out of the more than 30 ensembles that exist. And these are Gamelan Gambu, which is a direct link to the Majapahit era, Gamelan Gong Gede, Gamelan Smartangulingham, and the 20th century form, Gamelan Gong And in discussing Gong it's the most popular form of Gamelan ensemble in Bali because it can play music 
performed by older ensembles in both ritual and secular contexts. And we've discussed the notion of cotican, which is interlocking patterns with two parts that are played at very fast speeds.